Hello again. Hi. We have a next session on now. We have Gagan and Simon. They're both from the University of Melbourne and they're lucky enough to get to use Python and not awful languages. Let's make them feel welcome. Just testing, can you hear me there? Good. Okay, good. Master, what is the key for a good life? Well, that's easy, my disciple. Be simple, be open, be practical, and live in the present moment. But Master, that sounds like the Zen of Python. <laughs> that is why Python is so good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for having us here today. My name is Gagan Sharma and my background is in computer science. I've been working in the field of neuroscience from last seven odd years, and today I'm here with my colleague Simon Salinas. Simon is a mechanical engineer, but much more neuroscientist now. <coughs> last year, we loved the vibes at the Kiwi PyCon and at Wellington, and we thought it would be a great opportunity for us we can come here and present our work. So today we'll start by telling you why we are here and a little bit about our Python journey. Um, then we will introduce our work briefly. We will expose an agile image viewer customized to visually check brain scans. We will also show you the benefits of navigating image headers with PyDicom. And this is very useful for handling uh, medical images which contain sensitive data. And we will conclude with an example of how a few lines of Python code helps us to manage million dollar clinical trials that rely on remote processing machines around the world. We started coming to PyCon with the motivation of learning and presented our work for the first time in Australia earlier this year. And uh, now we're very happy to show you an improved version of this presentation with our latest updates. We're relatively new in this community. Gagan has been to PyCon since uh, 2013, and last year was my first time. So we felt like outliers at the beginning, but this, um, well, since most of you guys are professional programmers, so. Um, this community is very welcoming anyway, so uh, we're very excited to share our work with you. I'm not a programmer. I barely knew what Linux was when I started working in this field. But with time, I became comfortable with MATLAB and bash scripting. And I noticed Gagan was coming back from this type of conferences very excited, so I asked him, well, why travel so much when information is abundant these days and you can find pretty much everything on Google? He laughed and forced me to join him next conference, so I came to my first PyCon last year in Australia, then in Wellington, and then I understood there's some knowledge and inspiration you cannot absorb by Googling everything on an isolated corner. So this motivated us to start using Python more in our work and implementing the type of tools that we heard about in this type of talks. Now Gagan will tell you about the type of work we do, and then we will explain how Python makes our life easier when handling medical images. I will begin by telling you what we do at our work. This is us at the Brain Imaging Lab. We constantly receive images from the local scanners and from the sites around the world, and we process this data to enhance its value and output the pretty pictures and data for the high quality publications and for the clinical translation. These are the images with which we work all the time, and some of you already know what DICOM is. DICOM is a standard for handling, storing, printing, and transmitting information in medical imaging. The imaging part of it contains an image, and information about it is called header. It's the imaging of, it's a language of the medical imaging equipment. It's always worth telling the complexities in DICOM. These are the images with a lot of information embedded into a file. DICOM has many flavors as ice cream does. In some cases, inconsistencies in the tags can easily surprise you, and it breaks your code. Everything in DICOM is a tag, whether it's a doctor information, patient information, even the imaging data is referred as a tag. Every development has a story, and so does this. One day, we got approached by a clinician at work who needed a 3D data viewer with a very specific needs. He wants to read the DICOM and the other imaging formats, he wants it to be platform independent. He wants to use it as a module in the language of his own choice. And he wants the viewer to be quick, easy to use, et cetera, et cetera. I did not say no to him, not because I'm an Indian. I just thought it's a great opportunity for us to learn how to develop the 3D imaging data viewer. But then why to reinvent the wheel when there are so many imaging viewers already available in the market? 
Mind it, these are not the good DICOM wheels. These are the wheels with the great strength and functionalities. But in this particular situation, they were not ticking the boxes which was required. So I start looking for the language so I could use it in my programming. And we all know that these are the two dimensions where most of the programming languages fall. I'm always keen to use Python because I think it's easy to learn and use. So I start Googling and think, hey, whether Python will be suitable for my high performance computing? And the Google said yes. <laughs> Only if I can start with the code, which is readable. Really? I can barely read my own code, which I wrote three months before. <laughs> and on the top, I need to merge it with some pre, I mean, cool pre-existing compile libraries. We thought, hang on. If it's true for one minute, what I can do? It means that I can focus on the fun part, which is the science part here. And also, I can develop an application with less effort, more impact, without worrying about the nuts and the bolts of GUI. So I start looking again. I found Mayabi, Wispy, nice packages. But maybe I'm lazy. I thought, no, I can't do this. Spartacus can't do that. I don't have that much time. So I start looking again. I found a package called PyQt Grub. Some of you may already know about this. And the web page caught my attention. We thought, hang on. This particular image here, the brain image, Looks like what we do all the time, and maybe this could be adapted to our needs. I start looking into the features. Of course, the speed is the one. It is very responsive. It is portable and easy to install. It's suitable for the science and engineering. But that's how my first baby step started. I downloaded it. I started reading the examples. The code is so nicely written, easy to follow. I never thought that before. And this is all I did. I only wrote 24 lines of code with the teeny bit knowledge of a SciPy, a little bit NumPy. I injected this 24 lines code into original PyQt graph example. This is the original example, not mine code. So I injected my 24 lines into this and I got this in no time running 3D data view. Let's have a look at the 3D data view itself. So I'm just going to bring that. Okay. This is the, can you see? Yep. This is on the okay. screen. So I want you to focus on the three things. First is the contrast level. I have seen so many viewers struggling with changing the contrast level of an image so quickly. This, this tool is very responsive. I haven't seen anything in Python that responsive in terms of neuroscience. And also, this is a particular thing where you can view your data set at any arbitrary angle. And this is great for science. And you can go through the slices using the fast or the slow up and down arrow keys. And this was great for our application at that time. Let's get back to our presentation. So this is us using our viewer at work. And we were able to review 400 patients, each having a three different scans at three different time points. We were able to review them visually in a very simple loop. And we recorded the response of our clinicians. Hence, it's helping us to review the data for the publications. And then I feel like I'm a Spartacus. <laughs> Not a Spartacus, I can use my PySort to cut all the difficult code and save the day for my work using all this uh, 3D data view. But then, well, 3D data view was very good. It was impressive for the team. But then another challenge came, came up next month. And my personal greed also kicked in. I thought, why not 4D data view? And we just have shown you, or we just already showed you, how to read a volume. But that was only one time point. Now, we need to see the change in that volume over the time. And then we can focus on a single region slice frame to monitor the signal change, which represents the blood flow, as you can see on, on the screen in the video. Right now, what is happening when the signal is changing, the vessels are being brightened up, and then they're coming to the normal intensity. In trying to solve this challenge, we came across a more efficient way to read images for viewing using the power of Python's image IO package what ImageIO did for us. It read our data set, it sorts, which is the trickiest part in the 4D data set, and it provides us with the NumPy arrays. And what happens after that? All the 16 lines of my previous code got reduced to the two lines. Only these two lines, which I'm highlighting with a square. Of course, I felt like another Roman corrector. Maybe I'm watching too much Netflix these days. <laughs> but let's have a 4D data view itself. It's showing up here. Yeah, it's coming up now. So this is the 4D data set. On the y-axis, you can see that you can go through the slices in one volume. And on your x-axis is where you can go through that slice in all the time. You can see the signal change here, or the graph represents the signal change here, which tells us that at the time point 14, where Simon is pointing around, the signal starts changing. 
And now at the time point 20, you can see the vessels are bright enough. This is where the signal was maximum. And this tells clinicians that how the blood is flowing in the brain over time. Let's get back to again our presentation. It's, time, it's not the time for claiming the glory, but just to recap that all these sophisticated features were coded by someone else. You don't have to be an advanced programmer. You know, you just use someone's efficient code to create a responsive and a powerful tool so that you can use in your day-to-day -day work, and that is what we love in Python. We started showing you the viewers, but before show loading the images into the viewers, we need to show them in a way so that you can navigate easily. But sometimes we get this, one single folder, thousand, a couple of thousands of files in it, a complete mess. And that is where PyDiCom, another package, comes in, which makes our life easy. Now Simon will tell you how this package helps us a lot. That's right, now we will show you a great Python tool we discovered to process medical images. These are the raw medical images coming from the scanner, and here is where we have some flexibility to use Python for image processing. After this, we use specialized packages to take care of outputting these beautiful maps, depending on the type of information you want to extract from a brain scan. We will show you how we use Python in the processing stage of this pipeline. This is what you would normally get from the scanner, it's just that uh, data set with disorganized files dumped into a single folder. We use PyDiCom to output a nice folder structure that, is, that makes sense to scientists, um, sorted by patient name, scan date, and type of scan acquired. As Gagan mentioned, DICOM alone is an extensive field that could easily take up a whole presentation. What you need to know is that DICOMs were created with the aim to standardize images coming from different sources, and that is done by embedding critical information into the tags. These are the headers Gagan was talking about, and we need to access these tags to create organized folder structures. We will show you how to navigate these headers in a Pythonic way. Now it might seem like a mouthful of code. We've got Python on top and Bash on the bottom. Same result for accessing the headers, but um, tell me which method you find more intuitive. And I know the answer for this is obvious, you're Python biased. But uh, even if you're in love with Bash, um, you may find Python very convenient as you read the headers and they become variables straight away. Um, and there's less fiddling around with Bash reg regular expressions. Let's see how we do this in the command line. So we start by importing the PyDicom library. Then we assign, um, oops. We assign uh, the DICOM image to a variable. Then we read that file. And now we have access to all of the tags. For example, ds. Dot and that's what, sorry, Sam. Yep. That's what I was drafting. The pixel data file. itself is represented as a tag in the DICOM header. We also have a patient uh, name, for example, or we can print patient name. Uh, scan date and place where it was acquired. Again, we find it easier to navigate uh, headers through Python structures, as the bash alternative takes a lot more effort and string manipulation to store that information. We need to modify these headers because medical data is often regarded as sacred data due to privacy legislations, mainly in the first world. Some tags have doctor's name, patient age, hospital address, and other private data. So it's important to de-identify it properly when sharing it with other sites. Um, here's an example of how we do this on the command line again. So I'm going to de-identify the hospital name with a random variable. And I also remove um, patient name. And now we have cleared those two tags. The good thing here is we don't have to go through all of these tags individually, but we can make use of um, PyDicom libraries to strip them all in one go. And also, um, you, can, you can save uh, the de-identified images without having to override the originals. This was just one for one single image, but uh, this process can easily be scripted to scan the whole data set and output any folder structure. Here's an example of how we run the code for sorting and de-identifying 
I'm not going to go through the whole code. It's available in Bitbucket. One thing worth mentioning, though, is that um, we were able to improve it after coming to PyCon last year and hearing about a couple of libraries. Scandir to go through all files more efficiently and improve reading speed. We tried this instead of OS.walk and noticed that it wasn't working in the beginning, but that uh, Gagan contacted the developer and... Yeah, I mean, I contacted developer Ben. And there were some teething issues. We found those... Re uh, once we figured that out, that code really become very fast with this new library. That's right. Then we tried also docops to simplify parsing arguments into the script and found this one was particularly handy because you don't have to write the usage function, but it gets written automatically for you as you specify the input arguments. We're also having a look at uh, pandas for handling data structures. Uh, we just presented uh, from the medical imaging perspective, but the same concept of navigating headers with Python can be applied to any other imaging field. We will finish with a quick example of a Python script that helps us monitor machines across Australia, New Zealand, and Taiwan. We have around 30 remote, mach remote machines used for automated processing in several clinical trials. And it's important to make sure they're running 24-7. With just a few lines of Python code, we're able to detect signals coming from each machine and deliver an automated report um, into our inbox every morning. And um, I know this is probably very basic for those of you working in IT, but we were quite excited to get a daily report telling us um, if any of the machines were down close to full capacity or failing to connect to hospital servers. What we liked most was the simplicity and readability of the code, giving us so much power with just a few lines. And then after developing the 4D viewer, we are able to deploy that very quickly into these machines with no fancy installation, and we can uh, check the quality of the data remotely through SSH straight away. To summarize, the scientific community usually has their own preference on which software packages to use for image processing, but it's always possible to use Python to replace or pre-process data more effectively. Python provides readable code that can be easily adapted for custom image viewing and careful manipulation of sensitive data. Lastly, we're very grateful for PyCon inspiration that allow us to develop three excellent tools so come to this type of conferences and absorb what Google alone cannot provide. We would like to conclude by sharing a few lessons we learned from the main aspects of our workflow, which we discussed today using the data processing using PyDICOM and ImageIO, the data visualization using PyQD Graph and data management using the Python's API. Well, there are still times when we have to use some other software packages to support these three very important aspects of our work. We all know that it's not easy to change people, process, and the technology in a very well-established workflow, but we are getting there. At work now, we are trying to use every single opportunity where we could use the Python, not because Python is an agile, fast, and a portable tool, but also we strongly believe that, that in these exciting times, we can achieve almost everything with Python. The good thing is that if you're very specific about your software or software tools, you can still use Python because Python has the flexibility to join them together. In short, Python can be a glue with infinite possibility. But what next? Well, in the next coming months, we're going to be looking for our, for our needs from processing and data management on the NiPy, NiLearn, and XNAT, because th these tools have a great functionalities for the kind of workflow we have. But more specifically, we will be looking at the WizPy for two reasons. The first is that it is a very responsive and interactive library, which Simon is just trying to show you on this screen. And second is that we can view our data set from any particular angle. Now, right now on the screen is a 3D data set, which is volume rendering is there. And you can see the blood vessels here. On one side, the blood vessels are nicely fanning out, but not on the other because there is a blocked vessel there. What we need to do is that we need to add the fourth dimension here so that we can visualize the change in the blood flow in these vessels over the time. Because we personally think that it is a great tool for visualization, education, and research. Thank you very much. I like brains. Um, did we have any questions? Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Great talk. Oh, thank you. Um, this is just a question, while um, a trivial question, while other other people are thinking of serious ones. You had a slide, and it had some languages on it, and at the bottom, there was one that's that language that um, everyone hates. Well, what was that? A, for me, that was the machine language. That was the machine language. You know, the the olden days machine language. That's what I assume that it's not my slide. The source is written. We took from someone else. So yeah. I know that this question came up in my team also. Somebody said, which is like that language which you hate? I said, machine language. <laughs> the one which has a low level writing and all those ones, you know, in the olden days. Did we have other questions? Uh, do you use IPython at all? Have yes, you we use uh, IPython all the time. Without IPython, we can't learn all those functions because the tab function gave us accessibility to all those plethora of functions, and we learn straight away. This is the one I'm looking for. Yeah, if you're familiar with the command line, it's very handy. But otherwise, probably the notebook is friendlier. <laughs> going once, going twice. Sold. Cool. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Abby. Thank you.